for those who don't know me, my name is One. Um, I get the privilege of serving here as one of the pastors, and uh, it's a great joy. Uh, it really is to gather like this, um, to make much of God in various ways, uh, whether it's singing, praying, uh, opening up His Word. Um, he is the one to be glorified, and, and my hope is that uh, we would get a glimpse of that, uh, maybe more than a glimpse, that there would be just this overwhelming sense of His presence uh, among us here this morning. We are currently in the book of Psalms. Uh, we've turned the cassette around. We've put it back in the player, so it's side B. Um, we're in the second one of side B. Uh, and so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Psalm 55. Psalm 55 is where we are going to be. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, um, and then I'm going to read it. I'm going to read the entire Psalm, and then we're going we're to get to work. Uh, this is a heavy one, all right? The, the, the mood uh, it's not light, uh, it's not fun, uh, you're going to fight to find the joy in it. Um, it's a heavy psalm, and, and my hope is that we would, we would carry that heaviness, um, but then we would know where to carry it, uh, and David kind of points us in that direction, and so uh, here's what I'll do. I'll pray, like I said, we'll read it, and then we'll get to work, okay? Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Um, would you open it up? Would you make it plain to us? <clears throat> help us. Uh, help us to be uh, honest with ourselves. Uh, God, you already know what's going on. Uh, and so help us to be vulnerable, to be transparent, to know uh, what we are in desperate need of. Uh, and ultimately, it's you, Jesus. Um, and so uh, would uh, that become apparent to every single person here this morning. And then, Father, I pray that we would feel the weight of the psalm. Uh, that we would feel the emotion that David has as he, as he writes this and um, that, uh, that we would connect with it uh, and that ultimately it would point us to you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 55, you guys ready? Put your, put your seatbelts on. It's going to be a doozy. God, listen to my prayer and do not hide from my plea for help. Listen to my prayer. It's as if David is, is looking to the heavens and saying, God, don't turn your back on me. Do not hide from my plea for help. Pay attention to me and answer me. I'm restless and in turmoil with my complaint because of the enemy's words, because of the pressure of the wicked for they bring down disaster on me and harass me in anger. My heart shudders within me. Terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling grip me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, if, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. How far away I would flee. I would stay in the wilderness. I would hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. Lord, confuse and confound their speech, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they make the rounds on its walls. Crime and trouble are within it. Destruction is inside it. Oppression and deceit never leave its marketplace. Now, it is not an enemy who insults me. Otherwise, I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me. Otherwise, I would hide. I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion and good friend. We used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. Let death take them by surprise. Let them go down to Sheol alive because evil is in their homes and within them. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. I complain and groan morning, noon, and night. And he hears my voice. Though many are against me, he will redeem me from my battle unharmed. God, the one enthroned from long ago, will hear and, and will humiliate them because they do not change and do not fear God. My friend acts violently against those at peace with him. He violates his covenant. His buttery words are smooth, but war is in his heart. His words are softer than oil, but they are drawn swords. 
Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. God, you will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and treachery will not live out half their days. But I will trust you. David, why don't you just tell us how you really feel? <laughs> this, this psalm is written by, by someone in a lot of pain. I hope you see that. The more I studied this psalm, the, the more I saw that this comes from a, from a wide range of difficult experiences. Inside problems like sin, guilt, and shame. Outside problems like injustice, military threats, and betrayal. There is a lot going on here. Now, I don't think we can, with exact certainty, pinpoint the exact thing that caused the writing of the psalm. However, I am of the opinion, and many others as well think this way, that this could be pointing to the, the story that is found in 2 Samuel chapter 15, when David's counselor, Ahitophel, betrayed David and helped Absalom lead a revolt to overthrow David. Unfortunately, like many of us, David experienced more than one betrayal. Hence, I can't say with exact certainty that that's where this is from. But I think that there is enough information in the psalm, in the text, to take us down that particular road. Okay? So if we are going to do that, then we must ask the question, who is Absalom? And who is Ahitophel? And, and what exactly happened in 2 Samuel 15? Well, I'm glad you asked. You're at the right place. See, to answer this, to get more clarity on this, to, to feel the, the weight of this psalm, we must go to the beginning. Not to Genesis, but to 2 Samuel chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can meet me there. We're going to do a lot of going back and forth. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1 it says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, hear this, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. This is interesting. David, King David, he sends his army to war, but he remains. And not on official business. No, he remains so that he might chill. He was idle. And hear me, Rooted Fellowship, an idle man is a dangerous man. Especially one who has been anointed for a purpose. So don't get distracted. Men of Rooted, don't get distracted. Do not become an idle man. Verse 2, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, how convenient, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, I don't believe that this was the first time that David was taking this walk. I don't. He'd probably been on, on, on that roof a few times and, and had seen this woman a few times. Verse 3, he sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Now, in case you're new to the Bible, let me tell you how the story ended. He got his servants to go call her. He slept with her and impregnated her. Now, you might be thinking, hold on, I, she, she's, is she not married? Yes, she is. I, it's, you should know that David himself was married. So this is clearly wrong. 
just in case, you never know. Then, in his attempt to manage his sin, he calls Uriah back from war so that he will sleep with his wife, so that he would say, congratulations. But a confused Uriah, confused because he's wondering why he's been pulled out of the battlefield in the middle of war, he, he, he doesn't go home. No, no, no. He, he, he rather sleeps at the entrance with the king's palace guards. Here's what he says in verse 11. He says, the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I could never do such a thing. That is not an idle man. That is a man who knows what he is supposed to do. So he goes, this is strange. I cannot do this. So David, continuing to manage his sin, plots a plan to have Uriah killed in war. He, he stations him on the front line where the battle is the fiercest. Then gives the worst strategy ever. Intentionally ensuring that Uriah is killed. David is still managing his sin. Or so he thinks. It's clear that at this point, his sin is managing him. If you're in here this morning and you're going, you know what, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I've got control over this. I'm managing my sin. Let me tell you, you, you cannot. You, financial management, no problem. Construction management, absolutely. But you cannot manage your sin. It'll make you believe that, and then it won't be too long before you are being managed by sin. So this is what David does. He does all of this so that after Bathsheba has grieved the death of her husband, David can then swoop in and, and then take her as his wife and say, look, look at me how I take care of my beloved soldier's wife. And, and, and then, oh, by the way, we're pregnant. <laughs> what a coward. And God was not pleased. He was not pleased with this. In fact, in the text, in verse 27, it, it tells us, he says, however, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Not, not a misstep, not an accident, not a whoopsie, evil. Now, now, now you might be wondering, if you're listening carefully, you might be wondering, Oh, now, what does this have to do with Psalm 55? Hold on. I'm getting there. See, D David was living cozy for about nine months. He does all of this, and, and now he, live, he lives cozy for about nine months. And, 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 and maybe cozy is not the right word to use. B because it was eating him up. We, we know this because of what we read in Psalm 32. It was eating him up, but, but not enough to confess. Only when, when the prophet Nathan showed up with a parable, only then did it, it expose David for who he was, a liar, a murderer, and an adulterer. David then realizes his sin. He realizes that he had allowed sin to live rent-free in his life. Only then he, he then he then is convicted of this sin to the point where he repents and he seeks the Lord for forgiveness. And you know what the Lord does? The Lord forgives. Because God is good. God is gracious. God is kind. And so God forgives. If you confess, he will forgive you. Gosh, I, I, how I wish you would not just hear that, but that you would believe it. Because many of us, we are carrying our sin, going, I don't know if he will forgive me. I don't know if this time he will forgive me. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Amen. He will forgive you. Amen. He forgives David. However, there are consequences. Now you might say, hold on. 
honor, he, he repented. Yes, he did. He did. However, there are times in our lives where we sin, we repent, we receive the full forgiveness of our sins, and we have to face some consequences. We have to face the consequences of our actions. I mean, I mean there, there are times where you will, you, you, you'll do some things with your finances and you'll realize I'm living beyond my needs, that I'm trusting that these finances will give me what only God can give me. And then I repent and I seek his forgiveness and he does, but I'm still left with some financial loss. Or maybe I'll do something at work. I'll borrow for an extended period of time, stationary, without necessarily telling my employer that that's what I'm doing. That's a really nice way of saying stealing stationery, okay? So, so maybe that's what you do. And then they, you get caught and you go, oh, you know what, listen, God, I, I, I need your forgiveness. And he does, but you still get fired. Or maybe you're out there in the streets and you're doing your own thing and you, 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 you consume way too much alcohol and you're partying way too much and, and you end up in a car accident and, and, and you're like, oh my goodness. And you, you, you come to the Lord for forgiveness and he does and he forgives you, but you still go to prison. So, so what was the consequence of David's sin? 2 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 13 and 14, then, then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. <laughs> now, if you're feeling a little uncomfortable, I need you to know, so did I. I'm just going to keep it real. So did I. I was like, I read that. I was like, wait, what? Like I, like, I know the story, but there's something about it when you read it slowly, when you read it over and over again, you're just going, wait, hold on. Wait, wait. Forgiven. Thank you. Your child will die? But, but here's the thing. The, the, the more that I thought about it, the more that I realized that God loves us too much to let us stay in our sin. That's number one. That's the first realization. I went, okay, first and foremost, he, he, loves, he loves me way too much for me to stay in my sin. That he's going he's, he's gonna, he's gonna to bring someone or something just to make me wake up and go, wait, wait what I'm doing is wrong. So, so we should thank God for all the Nathans in our lives. We do a really good job at pushing them away. It's so easy. Like in that moment, it would, would have been so easy for, for, for David to go, but I'm the victim. My life is so hard. I'm the king. I have to rule all these people. I have to, uh, can I not just get a break? That's all I wanted. I, just, I don't want to go to I just wanted a break. I'm so tired. I do all these things. I make all these decisions. I carry all this weight. But you're still living in sin. And so we thank God for the Nathans in our lives. But number two, like reading this, the, the second thing that I realized is that, is that God loves us so much that, that, that he allowed his own son to die for our sins. I hope you catch that. That every time we read the scriptures, and these are, these are real people with real lives, these are real events, but, but as we read them, they are pointing to something bigger. Something bigger. And so as I read this, I go, well, hold on. God, God loves us so much that he allowed his own son to die. God understands the consequence of sin. So even as we read this and we're like, you know, God, it just, no, no, no. He understands the consequence of sin. It cost him his son. He understands the death of a child. There's, there's a lot of things that I don't fully get. I know sometimes people who stand in these positions and, and, and who do this, they can sometimes communicate as like, you know what, I get it all. I totally do. I understand everything. Shame on you. You don't understand. No, no. There's tons of things that I'm like, I don't fully get this. But you know what I do know is that God is wise. 
and that God is good and that God is gracious. I get, and, and so that's part of walking in, on this journey this, with this relationship that we have with God through Jesus by the power of the Spirit. It's, it's just to go, man, I don't fully get this. I don't, but you know what? I'm going to choose to trust you because I know that you're good and I know that you love me. Look, the point of all of this, the point of all of this is that David experienced the pain of loss. That in that moment, he experienced the pain of loss. And, and, and while Psalm 55 may not be the psalm that communicates that exact pain of loss, we, we can go to Psalm 51 for that. I, I, I want us to recognize this pain of loss. I want us to, to, to realize that, that, that David carried this, that even as we're going to unpack Psalm 55, we'll get to that. I, I want you to, to recognize that, that in all of this, there is that pain of loss. And so I, I just wanted you for a, a moment to permit me to off-ramp and for us to, to, to speak on this because, because I know in this very room, there are people who, who know the pain of loss. You do, you know the pain of loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of an opportunity, the loss of a dream. We all know the pain of loss, and, and, and I bring it up because, because at the end, David's going to point us to, to what we are to do with this, but, but we must recognize it, we, we, we must open up ourselves to it and to be honest with ourselves and to go, you know what, I am in a lot of pain. And that pain might be because of the pain of loss. David and Bathsheba mourned the death of their first son. But over time, they had a number of other children. In fact, David had a lot of children with a lot of wives. The Bible names 19 sons and one daughter. Her name was Tamar. And, and, and even that number doesn't count all the children that he had with his concubines. And let me tell you, this lifestyle that David had also had consequences. David didn't always have a happy family. Let's just say, when you do family your way and not God's way, your family reunions can quickly escalate to all-out war. And for David, it almost cost him the kingdom. Here's one situation. One I believe is the reason for Psalm 55. All right? So now we're back on, 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 on the road to Psalm 55. Again, I wanted us to offer him because the pain of loss is a real pain. And I, I, I do believe many times David carried that pain. But back on Psalm 55, here's what's going on here. You see, one of his sons rebelled against David. In fact, they, they, one of his sons wanted David dead. The story of Absalom and his rebellion can, can be found in 2 Samuel chapters 13 all the way to chapter 18. But how, how did we get here? How did we get to this place where, where your own son wants you dead? Well, here's where things went horribly wrong. One of David's sons, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. Tamar's brother, Absalom, Amnon's half-brother, like, I, I hope you're just, you're just trying to piece this together, like, we, from where, from who, who's, who's family reunion. And so Absalom was infuriated by his brother's sin, understandable, and eventually had Amnon killed. Absalom then fled to go live with his grandparents. Imagine telling that story around the dinner table. So I'd like to tell you that, well, here's, here's why I'm here. During that time, a, a bitterness grew in Absalom's heart. Absalom began to plot a, a rebellion to take the throne. And so he, he launches a PR campaign. He tricks 200 men into joining his cause. He even recruits some of David's advisors, and then he marches to Jerusalem. What does David do? 
Let me tell you what David does. He disguises himself and runs for his life. Very kingly. It's a great way of sorting out your problems, your family issues. What, what, what do many of us do? I'm out of here. I tell you this. Because, yes, we've spoken about the pain of loss, but, but here what he's, what, he's, what he's going through is, a, is the pain of strife, the pain of conflict. I've read it to you, but, but let me read it to you again. Psalm 55 from verse 2 says, Pay attention to me and answer me. I'm restless and I'm in turmoil with my complaint. There's a man who's on the run because his own son wants to kill him, and he's like, God, pay attention to me. Because of the enemy's words, because of the pressure of the wicked, for they bring down disaster on me and harass me in anger. My heart shudders with, within me. Terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling grip me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Gosh, I, I, I hope that you feel the intensity of these words. I said, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. How far away I would flee. I would stay in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. Friends, we, we know too well the pain of conflict. All of us, all of us know this pain of conflict. If, and if you don't, if you don't, you are either a baby, yet to experience the pain of conflict, or you're a liar. You pick. See, when, when sin entered the world, with it came conflict and strife between us and God, and then by implication, conflict with one another. Whether it's conflict at work, I hear so many of you talk about it like, man, I, at, 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 everything in my life is going great, but at work. Conflict with my with with with, with my uh, my fellow staff and 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 and, and with my boss and it just it's it just it's a hostile environment. Or maybe maybe for you it's conflict in your family. You hate going to family reunions because you know you know what's going to happen the moment you open the door and get out of the car. There it is. Co conflict with your siblings, conflict with your parents. Maybe you're here and you're going, there's conflict in my marriage. I, I'm, I'm experiencing the, the pain of conflict in my marriage. That, that when I go to bed, it feels like it's World War III, but, but the silent one. That's, that's probably the laugh of a man who's not married. He's going, I'm going to skip that bullet just over there. Yeah. Maybe you're a parent and you know the conflict, the pain of conflict with your kids. You haven't spoken to your kids in years. And again, you're too, like, there's always a reason. Oh, but you, they did this, I did this, this is what happened. If they only, if they, I sacrificed, I, did, I get it. I'm, I'm not, like, I'm not trying to push that to the side. I'm just trying to say, hey, listen, there is, there is something happening there. And It's painful. We experience all kinds of, 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 of conflict. And, and here's, here's what conflict does. The, the, the pain of conflict, the pain of strife, it, it steals from us. It steals joy from us. It steals opportunity from us. I mean, you might be sitting here going, you know what, I was in a season like that, but praise Jesus that, that like we are beyond that. But you look back on that season, you're like, what a waste. What a waste. It steals time from us. This is where David is. The pain of conflict. But, but then he goes deeper in this pain. He goes deeper in this pain. It's not just strife, but he, he then also speaks of the pain of betrayal. Oof. That one's hard. The pain of Betrayal. Read with me verse 12. He says, 
Now, it is not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, who is my peer, my companion, a good friend. We used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. Let death take them by surprise. I, I told you at the beginning, I love the Psalms because of its raw emotion. You know, here, man, we, we create a great environment to pretend and perform. Right? Here's how we handle betrayal. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, you know, it's, was, I'll be okay. It's totally fine. But he says, let death take them by surprise. Let them go down to Sheol alive. Let me, let me give you 2024 translation. Let them go to hell. <laughs> Whoa, David? Like, is that even theologically correct? Like, can you say that? But he said, let, let them go to hell. Ever been there? Now, again, you might be way, way, way more mature than me, Right? So it's like, oh, I would never say that on air. <laughs> come on, I mean, come on. Been a, been a Christian 10 years. John 3.16, so God so loved the world. That's why I love Jesus. Because he goes, you know what? Um, have you ever murdered anyone? Of course not. Do you have anger in your heart towards someone? <laughs> yeah, then you're a murderer. You're a murderer. The, the word seller comes up a few times here. I was chatting to um, Cornelia, who is an incredible violinist, and she was telling me that um, this word seller is, is well known in the music uh, space. Uh, in fact, when you play in a massive concert, and uh, you'll definitely correct me who I'm wrong after this, but there's a particular note um, and that uh, when you see it, uh, what it communicates is that as a musician, it allows you to pause until you are ready. I love that. Pause until you are ready. Now, I wish, I wish we had time. But for some of us in here, you, you just need to pause for a moment. Because it's so easy to quickly go over this, to, 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 to but, you know, uh, on a, let me tell you, uh, I, I see, I, it's like, no, 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 stop for a moment. Have you experienced the pain of betrayal? Where in your heart, you're just like, I, I just want the worst for those people. God, would you intervene and would you send them to hell? But look at verse 16. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Now, I, I believe what's happening here is, let me go ahead and tell you, you cannot ask God to send people to hell without first asking him to send you. And you should look in the mirror, and you're like, you know what? If we're going to talk about betrayal, I need to recognize that I have betrayed you. That I have betrayed you, God. And so if you, if you are going to send people to, then let me be the first. And so there's, there's this, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, God. Here's where I am. I'm all for it. Some of you need to learn how to be honest before God. God can take it. God, here's how angry I am. Here's how desperate I am. Here's how frustrated I am. Here's how confused I am. Say it. And then, and then recognize, recognize the grace that has been poured on you and then try to figure out what that means in your relationship with your betrayers. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Now, we could, we could read this portion and think he's still talking about his son, Absalom. But he says something different that makes us think different. In verse 13, he says, But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion and good friend. 
See, I don't believe David would consider Absalom his peer. I mean, he says in verse 14, we used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. David, you must be talking about someone else, a friend, a close friend. And look, we don't have to go too far to try to figure out who this is. One of the advisors that Absalom was able to bring over from David's side to his was a man called Ahitophel. Now, who is he? Again, I'm glad you got asked. You guys are asking great questions this morning. Ahitophel was, was a, a close counselor to David. This man had the gift of wisdom. This is, this is the kind of man that you wanted on your side. 2 Samuel verse, chapter 16, verse 23 says this. Now, the advice of Ahitophel gave in those days was like someone asking about a word from God. Such was the regard that both David and Absalom had Ahitophel's advice. It says that this man was, was just so full of wisdom, it was as if that you were getting uh, wisdom from God himself. See, when Ab Shalom began his rebellion, King David knew that Ahitophel's advice would be dangerous in the hands of his son. This is the pain of betrayal. We used to sit late at night talking strategy. I don't know if you've ever had a relationship like that where it's like you're able to talk business and at the same time you're able to get real personal and, and just laugh and cry together. And now you're on the other side. Now you're against me. The pain of betrayal. Anyone familiar with this? Could be a friend, could be a family member, could be your spouse. Someone who you told everything to, but now they care nothing for you. In fact, they want you dead. This hurts, friends. But it, but it hurts deeper when the betrayal is by another believer, another child of God, someone in the church. It just, it just, it just takes it to the next level. I, I, I know too much about this betrayal, this kind of pain. And I know many of you do as well. And so there is the pain of loss. There is the pain of conflict. There is the pain of betrayal. What are we to do with all this pain? What do we do with a psalm like this? It's one of those psalms where you kind of wish I could just tear it out. Give me the ones of joy. As the deer pants for water. What are we to do with all this pain? Well, I believe that we have three options presented to us. Two of them are absolutely horrible, and yet we continue to do them. And one of them is a solution that we need. This is what we do. We, you, you, can either, you can either cover, carry, or cost. Those are your options. What, what, what am I to do with all this pain? Well, you can either cover it, you can carry it, or you can cost it. Let me explain. You can, you can cover up your pain and try to convince yourself that you're okay. That it doesn't affect you, that you'll be okay. I generally uh, run in this direction, right? You'll, you'll cover it and you'll be like, no, I'll be okay. And then you just smile with everyone. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> It's always like, there's, like there's, an, there's an extra something to it at the end of the word. That's, that's a dead giveaway. I'm going, great. Because <laughs> you're forcing the words out of your mouth when in reality you're in so much pain. I was cooking pasta for my family the other day and my, our little one, uh, she, she loves cooking. I, I'm convinced she loves cooking. And so she's standing with me by the stove and cooking pasta and I'm explaining to her everything that I'm doing and putting in the hot water and I'm putting in some salt. And if you put oil in your pasta when you're cooking it, you're doing it wrong. Okay? That one's for free. Stop doing that. It doesn't stick properly. You know, you're just not cooking it properly. But anyway, so I'm, I'm doing all the things and I'm explaining it to her. And then I put the top on, right? You all know what happens. That's why I said, like, we'll leave a little, little bit open or, or you, you've got all your strategies. Some of you put a spoon on top. You do all the things. But, but I put the, the top on and I did it for education purposes. And we waited. 
And over time, it, as it bubbled up, obviously the, the, all that, 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 that water started com- coming out of the pot. It was crazy, causing a scene on the stove. That's what we do when we try to cover up our pain. It looks okay, right? In the beginning, it's, like it's, it's not too bad. But over time, it's going it's to boil over and it's going to leave a mess. And hear this. For me, I, I stepped away for a moment and it was when I heard the cry of our seven-year-old that, Papa, something is wrong. I had to run. And she, I mean, she's trying to do something as a seven-year-old, but she can't do anything. But we, we can sometimes leave a mess for other people. Things that we should have sorted out ourselves, we now hand over to our kids. And we hand over to our grandkids. Why? Because we're not willing to, to deal with the pain. We're trying to cover it up. Don't cover it up. That's, that's not a solution for you. But, but you know what other people do? Others carry it. So, so, you, so you might go, you know what, I don't cover it, honey. You know, why would I do that? No, I just carry mine. I, I'm like this everywhere I go. Here's my pain. Everywhere I go. Hey, how, how are you? It's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's great. No, I would love to serve. I can't wait to serve. How? C- can you lend a hand? Yeah, absolutely. Hold on. I'm just, you know, I'm carrying this. I hope you see it. It's, it's, it's you know, it's quite, quite a load here. I hope you see it. But let me try to help you. You actually don't realize that you carrying it is a, is, it's a cry for help, but it's a cry for help on your terms. So, so, so when people come and they go like, hey, listen, you, what are you carrying? Can I, can I, no, 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 hold on, hold on. No, I'm just, I, I think I can, I can manage this. I can handle this. People who carry their pain really, like, it's so hard for you to receive love. You can't receive anything. How does someone get their arms around you when you're carrying your pain? But then you'll go and say, no one loves me. No one cares for me. No, we want to. We want to, but you're carrying this pain. So you can cover. You can carry both horrible, horrible ways of trying to figure out the pain in your life, or you can cost. That's the solution that David offers us. Verse 22, he says, cost your burden on the Lord. To cost, I love this word, to cost means to to throw, to fling, to eject, to remove. It's not a simple placing. It's not like, oh, I'm just place it gently. No, it's to recognize that what I have is not helpful for me and to, it's to eject it from your life. And then here David tells us, but where? Is it to other people? No, please don't. It's not a rugby ball. There you go, skip pass. Oh, there, can you, can you grab this pain quickly? <laughs> no, we're told to cast our burdens onto the Lord. How do, we, how do we do that? Can you make it more plain? No problem. We've got, to, we've got to learn to forgive. That's what I believe is going on here. To, to, cast, to cast your burdens to the Lord, it, it, it's, it's to forgive. And I know, I know, I know that some, like you're sitting here and you're going on it, but you have no idea. You have no idea what has been done to me. I'm not saying hey, let's quickly jump to reconciliation. Let's quickly jump to restoration. Let's quickly, no, no, you've got to be best friends with that person. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm saying, hear me. I'm saying, forgive. What, what is to forgive? To forgive is to release. Release. And forgiveness is a supernatural thing. We sit here and we're wondering like, yo, but Rainbow Nation, 94, why are we not where we should be? It's because to forgive is a supernatural act. I believe the church took a back seat in our pursuit for peace and unity and reconciliation. The the church took a back seat and said, let the constitution be the power that we need. Let the HR policies help us. I'm not against those things. But the reason that the church needed to stay in the fight is because we recognize that forgiveness is a supernatural thing. And the only reason that I can forgive is because I have been forgiven. The only reason that I can release is because I have been released. 
Cast your burden on the Lord. On the Lord, on the Lord, on the Lord. Jesus understands the pain of loss. Jesus understands the pain of conflict. Jesus understands the pain of betrayal. And he overcame it. That's why we can cast our burdens onto him. That's what David does. He goes, you know what? My life is an absolute mess. It's an absolute mess. And so I'm going I'm to cast... I'm going to cast my burdens onto you. God, would you give me the supernatural power to forgive? Would you give me the supernatural power to release? I don't know. I don't know. Look, I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know in which direction things will go. But whatever happens, I'll, I'll be able to navigate through it because I am in a place of peace. God can handle it. He can handle it. Jesus on the cross, he cries out, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. He's the only one who had every right to go, but you did this and still be righteous. And he says, forgive them. Father, release them. Father, with the, the blood that I am shedding, would it cover them? Father, would they experience your tenderness and your mercy? Yes, those very ones who are crying out to me, die. To, to, to the ones who've betrayed me, to the ones who've left me, yes, them as well. Would, 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 you, would you cover them with your grace? Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. Listen to that promise, to that step of obedience. I hope you notice that, that in all the promises that we read in here, either before it or after it, there is a, a step of obedience that is required. Sometimes, bless me, bless me, Lord, bless me. And say, I want to. I want to. I have all this, this blessing that I want to, to give you, to shower you with, but you're going, but, but I will not take that step of obedience. And he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Oh, but, but, but on it, I feel shaken. Maybe even now you're sitting in your seat and you're, 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 you're struggling to receive this message. You don't know what to do with it. I feel, I feel shaken. But he tells us here, he will sustain you. See, by, by shaken, David means to say, God will never allow the righteous to, to be beyond recovery, beyond redemption, beyond hope. So, so shake a little bit, no problem. In fact, here's another way to say it, that, that it's okay to grieve. Grieve deeply. Learn to grieve deeply, to lament, to cry out to God and to be like, God, here, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm going through. I don't want to pretend and perform with you because I don't have to. I, I, I'm in desperate need of help. Pay attention to me. Grieve deeply. In this fallen world, de grieve deeply. But, but hear this, we, we as the children of God, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. That's the difference. You can lie on the floor and cry, cry it all out, but we don't stay on the floor. And the reason we don't stay on the floor is because our Savior is not in the grave. Our Savior is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so while you are grieving deeply, he is praying for you over and over and over and over again. He is sustaining you. He is empowering you. He is the one who lifts you. He's the one that gives you all that you need to be able to take that step forward. And here's a really amazing thing. I don't know. I don't know if you've been walking with Jesus for a while. I don't know if you've been uh, through Psalm 55 in your life a few times. Maybe, maybe this is you, that you've experienced the full circle of God's grace. 
I have. Where, where God sustains you and strengthens you in such a way that you have the ability to turn to others and help them, to strengthen them, to walk with them, to point them to our Lord and Savior. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you today. Have you ex have experienced the comfort from God to only discover that you want others to find the same comfort? That's God's beautiful way of multiplying His grace through real, human, raw interaction. This is what should happen. I wish I could say that this is what happens in every single church. And I, and I do, I say it in faith. But this is what should happen in the life of the church. Verse 23, let me close this out. God, you will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and tre treachery will not live out half their days. But I will trust in you. I read verse 23 and I, I interpret it as this. God, God, you have a way of figuring out all of this. You know what I pray a lot of? I pray for justice. I do. In, in, in seasons and in moments that I don't quite understand, in, in moments of like, like what is going on and, and this pain and betrayal and this, and it, like I search my own heart first to make sure that, hey, where, where am I? I'm not always as innocent as I think I am. And then I repent. And I pray, I pray that I have enough Nathans in my life who are willing to come and be like, yo, I need to talk to you about something. I don't fear you, I fear God. You may hate me, no problem. But I do everything to the audience of one. Can I tell you a parable? And then to tell you that God forgives. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. Yeah, Satan's in your ear going, yeah, you see, I told you, you're a loser. I, I told you you'd be back here on your knees crying out to him. I knew it. I told you. But we need to be reminded, man, I, I can't stop telling my kids this, and so I won't stop telling you this. But Satan is a double loser. You tell him to his face. He's a loser. He lost the first time where Jesus tells us that he, he saw him fall from heaven like lightning. It was that quick. His defeat was that quick. And then he lost when Jesus cried out, it is finished. And if you believe that that counted for you, then you will be saved. And so God has a way of figuring it out. And, and so God, I, I pray for justice. And my first prayer is always justice this side of heaven. The, the justice that is experienced on the cross, that that, that, that person's sin would, would, would be nailed to the cross and that they would experience life and life to the full in you. That they would recognize their sin and they realize that they're in desperate need of a savior and that one day I might be able to call them brother or sister. That one day we will be surrounded by others as we surround the throne. And we just tell story after story after story. Hey, here's who I was. And then Jesus showed up in my life. Here's who I was, and then Jesus showed up in my life. Oh, praise be to the one who is seated on the throne. So I pray for that justice. But for those who do not bend the knee and make the confession, there is justice awaiting them. The Bible tells us every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The question is, are you gonna bow now or are you gonna bow later? The implications are massive. But I will trust in you. You see, at each essential moment in this psalm, we can see the whole spectrum of our faith. S summarized in three short sentences. I need help, this is hard, I believe. And so maybe this morning that's, that's you, that's all you have. 
you, you, you just you don't have the capacity in this moment to, to, to bring everything to the forefront. You just, you, but you, you're there, you're there. And so maybe for you, this is all you say. I need help. This is hard. I believe. That's how he ends it. He says, but I will trust in you. And so we're going to sing. I believe we're singing Cornerstone. We're going to sing Christ alone, Cornerstone. The weak made strong. And so if you're weak, would you come? Would you come to cost, to cost your burdens? Treat, treat this as an altar, if you will. And come and, and get on your knees and cast your burdens and say, I, I am weak, but you are the one who makes strong. I need help. God, this is hard. But I believe. And would you walk out of here completely different to how you came in? Would you walk out here a little bit lighter? Would you walk out here feeling that you have released that those things that you were carrying, those things that you were covering, would you, would, you, would you walk out of here going, you know what, my hands are wide open to receive every good thing that God has in store for me. And so, Father God, that is our prayer this morning. Father, I pray that now as we respond in song, that this would be more than just words on a screen. We're singing a familiar song, but, 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 but would you not make the gospel so familiar in our lives that we just kind of pass over this? Would we be blown away yet again by your grace and your mercy and your tenderness and your kindness? The Bible tells us it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And you are kind to us. I pray for every single person here who's carrying a burden. Would they know by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus, you have died for that. Body broken, bloodshed. that you experience the pain of loss, that you experience the, the pain of conflict, that you experience the pain of betrayal, and, and yet you still initiate to us. Ephesians tells us that, that we were your enemies, God. The children of disobedience. And yet still, you... You come hard after us. I, I think of the, the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the loving father who wastes no time when he sees his son and runs to him. God, you run to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Would you wrap your arms around us Would you call for beautiful garments to be placed on us? Jewelry that reminds us that we are your children. And would we walk into the greatest celebration to ever happen? To know that we are reconciled back to you. And so I pray, I pray for the heaviness in this room to be lifted. I pray for chains to be broken. I pray for idols to be smashed. I pray for fear to be cast out. And then I pray for an overwhelming sense of your presence. Would it be like the oil that is poured over those who are to be anointed? So would you anoint this place with your love, with your forgiveness, with your mercy, and with your grace. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.